my name is Naoko Shimazu, and I am professor at the Asia Research Institute. And before I'm going to introduce our roundtable panel this afternoon, I'd like to draw your attention to the Asia Research Institute's 20th anniversary this year. This roundtable is the second of the eight specially commissioned in the RE20 anniversary roundtable series and culminating in the finale on the 11th of November on RE and Asian futures in humanities and social sciences research. Uh, when we'll have Ari's research cluster leaders, and we'll also launch a specially commissioned um, video. Now, our moderator tonight is Professor Isaac Curlow. In 1995, he was invited to Singapore to start the first comprehensive professional school of art, film, and media in the country. That adventure, as he calls it, turned into 15 years of working and living in the country. After a few years, as professor and the founding dean of the School of Art, Design and Media at the Nanyang Technological University, Professor Kerlo was invited to join the Earth Observatory of Singapore, one of the country's five research centers of excellence. As principal investigator at the observatory, Professor Kerlo and his team of young Singaporean and Southeast Asian creators collaborated with scientists to develop interdisciplinary projects that help us to better understand natural hazards. Many of those projects took Ms. Uh, Professor Curlow to locations throughout Southeast Asia with a saturated presence of natural hazards. So tonight's roundtable is centered on one of those projects, a documentary feature film about the tsunami that struck the Indonesian city of Banda Aceh in 2004. So this afternoon, we have three experts joining the conversation about the topic intimately related to the tsunami, which is about the challenges of telling the story from the point of view of those who lived through the disaster and its aftermath. So, um, Professor Kolo, I pass on to you. Thank you so much, uh, Naoko, for that nice introduction. And thank you, Ari, for inviting us to talk about the topic of representing disasters from the inside out from the perspective of the locals who endured the disaster. Um, this round table is centered around a, a film, The Tsunami of New Dreams. Uh, I want to thank Ari for their support during the last stages of editing the film. Also my uh, Ari colleagues at the uh, Inter-Asia Engagements Cluster for providing really valuable feedback uh, during the editing of the film. I also want to take, uh, thank our, our participants uh, tonight, uh, Annabelle, Michelle, and Rizana, who were particularly helpful in providing feedback uh, during the film. Uh, but most importantly, I, I would like to thank on everybody's behalf uh, and, and my own, the Banda Ache residents who allowed us to talk to them about their lives and allowed us to walk into their living rooms and discuss uh, personal issues about the tsunami. Um, this film is dedicated to them. Before we screen our first clip, I just want to mention a couple of ideas about the genesis and the purpose of the film. Uh, when we first went to Banda Ache uh, a few years ago, several years ago, I should say, um, I became very curious about the tsunami and, and the details of how the tsunami had uh, happened uh, and how it had impacted uh, the community in, in such a, a terrible way. So of course I started looking for references and other works on the web. And to my surprise, I, I wasn't able to find a lot more than uh, television news clips uh, and uh, most of them were really about the physical destruction and the devastation. And they, they really didn't explain anything. They didn't offer any reflection on the event or its impact on the community. Um, I also found a lot of clips that tried to explain from a, a geosciences point of view, the reasons the, behind the tsunami, how the 
the tectonic plates split, how the earthquake occurred, but there was nothing really for an outsider to understand how the tsunami had happened throughout uh, the, the event and, 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 and before and after. So um, I talked to people in Rwanda Aceh during our early visits um, about the, the, the tsunami and I got the impression that a lot of them, when we were in groups, they really didn't want to talk about the tsunami. They just wanted to move on. But when I talked to individuals one-on-one, uh, -on -one, everybody was very willing to, to share details and they were very eager to, to talk about what had happened and uh, what they thought about towards the future. And so little by little, it, the, the, the idea of making a film, a community film about the tsunami took shape and that's really how this uh, effort started um, uh, by having individuals from the community talk about the issues that were important to them. And then we recorded it. And a few years later, we had a film. Uh, I apologize if I am not making a lot of sense, but it's three in the morning for me here in Mexico City. So I. I, uh, I will do my best. All right, so last idea, the main goal therefore of behind this film um, is really about maxima maximizing the impact that a film of this type can have on the future of the community, help the community uh, process the event uh, become a centerpiece to talk about the event, discuss the event publicly. And I do want to thank Ari for providing uh, support uh, to uh, translate the film into uh, create subtitles in Indonesian so that in the next few months we will be releasing the film uh, in Indonesia so that people there and in Aceh can watch it.
Okay, so I uh, we will move on now to uh, discussing the film, and I would like to introduce uh, one of our presenters, Dr. Annabel Tay Gallup. Um, Annabel is head of the Southeast Asia section at the British Library. She received her PhD from University of London, and her research focuses on the British Library's Malay collections, writing traditions, book cultures and the art of the Quran in Southeast Asia and the Indian Ocean world. Um, Annabel has written many books. Uh, I am very familiar with her latest book uh, called Malay Seals from the Islamic World of Southeast Asia, uh, a very comprehensive catalog, a beautiful book. And um, I would like to um, ask Annabel, uh, if you can please uh, comment on the fact that, you know, this film tries to capture the local voice, the local experience, local issues, local perspective. So in a few minutes, um, would you be able to give us, in your opinion, if the film manages to do that and why? Thank you, Isaac. Um... I think for me, one of the most um, interesting and actually probably successful aspects of the film, as those of you who've, who've just enjo um, joined us for this, uh, the first clip will perhaps have, have been startled to realize, is that there's no, um, there's no commentary, there's no um, authorial voice sort of telling you what is going on and what to think. Um, the pictures and later on the interviews speak for themselves. And that's, um, I think, a really, really important and um, it, and it, this is what gives the film the, the ring of authenticity. Now, Isaac was really kind to mention my, my work and my, my, you know, my publications, which are very much on the writing culture, the manuscript culture of Indonesia and the Malay world and my new book, um, of, which is a catalogue of Malay seals, which was published actually by NUS Press in Singapore. But I should I should perhaps just pull out the fact that that book um, catalogues um, lists more than 2000 seals, Islamic seals used in Southeast Asia over the past um, 500 years and a full um, more than 500 of those seals. So about a, a, a fifth of the entire book are from Aceh. And that just is, um, I mentioned that to give you a sense of what an incredibly rich history Aceh has as a region. And therefore um, it feeds into the psyche of the people. And so the people um, you will be seeing interviewed in this film and who will be recounting their experience, speak, they will be speaking from this perspective also of being Achenese, of being very, very um, confident of their own history and their own identity. And I think that is something that comes through alongside the trauma that they, um, that they have experienced. They are speaking, um, you know, with kind of centuries of dealing with a very, very um, important history and also a long experience of, of remembered conflict and trauma as well. But um, Isaac asked me about the most interesting, well, some of the most memorable parts of the film. And I think to me in particular, because we all from, particularly from the outside, the tsunami was um, not just an Indonesian, not just an, um, an Achenese event, but it was had impact throughout the region. But what most um, people are very unaware of outside is the fact that the tsunami took place in the midst of an ongoing conflict, an armed conflict in Aceh, where, um, uh, where the um, rebe rebel group GAM, Gerakan Aceh Merdeka, had been fighting against government forces for many years and the impact this had had on people's lives. And I think that is captured and that is one of the many voices that comes out in the film that perhaps will be, will be most um, surprising and illuminating for other people who view the film. So that's for me one of the most memorable aspects of this film, Isaac. Thank you, Annabelle. Uh, yeah, I failed to mention that uh, one of the key aspects of this uh, moment in history is the fact that uh, at the same time during the tsunami period, there was a civil war uh, going on in Aceh. And uh, we will talk about later, but that, that is definitely one of the key components of this uh, uh, episode. Okay, I would like to 
introduce our next uh, panelist, Dr. Michelle Miller. Michelle is Senior Research Fellow at ARI at the Asia Research Institute at uh, National University of Singapore. And her research focuses on intersections between the political geographies of environmental governance and urban change. Michelle has conducted ethnographic and archival research on emerging spaces and boundaries of environmental governance, social justice, conflict resolution, and urbanization in Indonesia. Michelle is also a prolific writer, and uh, one of the uh, many texts that she has authored is actually about the conflict, the civil war, which is referred to as the conflict uh, in Aceh. Uh, so I would like to ask uh, Michelle the, the same question. Uh, uh, what makes for you this film uh, memorable and how does it capture the essence of the tsunami and the Aceh experience? Thanks, Isaac. I just want to say um, congratulations on your New Hope Film uh, Festival Award as well that you recently got. It's a beautiful film and so thoroughly deserved. And I know how many iterations, as do the other pr presenters, how many iterations went into making this particular film and how, because we, we've seen so many versions before and it, the final product is just beautiful. Um, so I, like Annabelle, I really like the way people spoke for themselves. There were no voiceovers. And I think that that was very important in conveying a sense of authenticity uh, throughout the film and in capturing, and also you captured a, diverse, a diversity of voices. So uh, you had ordinary citizens, kids, adults, uh, women, men, uh, local leaders, village leaders, a, a civilian leader, uh, Rusli and, uh, and Muharram, the, the GAM leader. The only people I thought were missing were the ulama and uh, and security forces personnel, but I understand there's uh, there's probably reasons for that as well. Um, but I felt that throughout the film, it nicely wove together the reciprocal relationship of Achenese people with the Indian Ocean as a giver and taker of life. And and I like the way you sustained this throughout the film. These these human water connections uh, in lots of ways, both subtle and and direct. So. There's the direct ways with the, the fishermen uh, pulling in their boats, the traditional dance performance showing the continuation of uh, Achenese culture uh, by the water's edge at Lampa'uk Beach, the, the fish market and uh, the, the, the interview material with Zura, the fish seller surrounded by her dried fish and octopus. And, and then the scenes of tourists and wet, wet, wet rice cultivation showing the renewal of life and then there's also these subtle poignant scenes. And the one that really grabbed me was uh, in the room with Amir, the contractor, who, uh, who was crying over the loss of his family with a conch shell hanging on the wall behind him. Uh, so there was that, that reminder in the background that the sea was, had taken away all that was dear to him. Um, in terms of scenes that really caught my attention, uh, I have to say the original footage is what really grabbed me. And there were three scenes in particular that stood out for me in the film. Uh, the first one, which I missed in the first uh, screening because I was, I was so overwhelmed by everything else. But uh, at about 11 minutes in, there's a civilian guy carrying a machine gun running down the main street. And there's this grainy image and nobody's even looking at him. They're just driving their cars and vehicles as fast as they can to get away from him. And, and it was just such an amazing image because it showed both the futility of weapons in that moment of crisis when they'd been everything before it and also that the absurdity of the moment because in any other situation people would be running away from that guy and and he would he would be the invoker of panic and um of uh, the second image of uh, 47 minutes into the film uh that i loved because it captured the resilience of youth was uh, and also the indefatigable spirit of Achenese people that you, you uh, speak of in the epilogue uh, was where there's a group of people who are walking away from the camera, women carrying parcels of food on their heads, men carrying water containers. And then off to the left-hand side, there's this little girl who's also walking away into this landscape with nothing but ruin and debris and waste before her, skipping. And... And it was swinging her water bottle around as if she just doesn't have a care in the world or as if she just needs to keep being exactly who she is, regardless of all that chaos around her. 
it was it was just uh, startling that little girl in that image. And then I think the third one that that struck me because of the political moment was where the two Brimob, uh, the Indonesian paramil paramilitary police uh, officers, were carrying a corpse through the water together with the Achenese civilians, and that kind of scenario would have probably been unthinkable just a day before because of the fear that the Brimob uh, officers invoked because of their thuggery and brutality against the civilian population. And yet here, here we are uh, 24 hours ahead of what would have been a completely different scenario, everyone putting aside their differences and, and, and realizing that they need to work together in this moment of uh, shock. Um, and that also stood out for me in the in the Rusli, in the interview with Rusli, the village head, who, um, who's, when he said that his first thought or the first thought of people around him was to carry the corpses to the Bremob station rather than to a place within the community. Um, and it, just one final thing, apart from the original footage, uh, as with your other films, um, I, I really like your animation techniques. Uh, you've I've, I've commented on it with in a, a Chiro with the, with the wave and haze. It's complicated. You've got a beautiful way of bringing an almost playful dimension into um, to bear on really dark and complex issues. And and I felt that that whole black and white pixelated debris moving through space and then the sharp splintered wood and the vehicles crashing through houses and smashing homes and it, it created this. Um, sense of the enormity of the situation, but also the fragility of humans in that event. Thank you, Michelle, for such a vivid description of those moments, which, as you say, are, are, are key in telling the story. Um, I would like to introduce our third panelist, Dr. Rizana Rosemary. Rizana is a researcher at ICAIOS, the International Center for Ache and Indian Ocean, Ocean Studies, and she's also a lecturer at the Department of Communication Studies at Shakuala University in Banda Aceh. Rizana specializes in issues of communicating health, climate change, and disaster risk reduction. Uh, uh, Rizana was also, is also assistant producer uh, in the film. Uh, she came to many of our locations uh, with her charming family uh, so she and she she helped us uh, uh, get in touch with many of the people who were interviewed. So she has a very uh, intimate knowledge of, of the production of the film. So uh, Rizana, could you also, as, as a as a person who grew up in Bandache, uh, tell us how the film manages to capture this Achanese essence and the the experience of the local people? Firstly, uh, I'd like to thank you, Ari, for the invitation and everyone for having me here. So I think the film really has managed to capture what had happened 17 years ago. I may say this not because I was partially involved in the film production, and I may not represent also the stories and experience of those people who, di how, who are directly affected by the tragedy. Because for information, I was not in Banda Aceh on that day. I was in Jakarta, but I've lost about more than 50 of my close families and relatives because of the tsunami. My father came from uh, Malabo, which is uh, West Aceh, where the epicenter of the earthquake, earthquake strikes that time. And most of my family's members live there. So I just, and we just have to accept that, that they all become the victims of the tsunami. That's why it's a problem because I'm not there, but uh, I probably could uh, represent myself as the voice for, uh, as an Indonesian and an Achenese. So this film for me really succeeded in helping people like me to reflect and to relate on what happened on that day. If I could recall, it was on Sunday morning. Uh, I had a phone call from my cousin uh, who was on top of a tree. And then he comes yelling and telling that the Grand Mosque was on flood. We couldn't, we didn't have any idea what happened that time. 
uh, and then afterwards there's no more connection. Uh, but then we saw on breaking news on one of the private channel television, uh, the severe condition in Aceh. So I think the film really expressed the same feelings of what I feel that time and also the people who are directly affected. My feeling was as similar as uh, Pa Arif, one of the characters in the movie. He was also in Jakarta and how he explained himself uh, not knowing what had happened to his wife in Banda Aceh. So uh, yeah, for me, it's it still a reconnect when I watch that kind of movie and the moment in the scene which really what my mind was the, se the second section, which is the wave, all about water. Because I lost contact with my parents and my parents-in-law almost three days after the tsunami. And even my uh, brother who tried to fly to Bandache the next day to evacuate them or see what's... Uh, when I had a chance to come back a couple of months after the tra tra tragedy, I'm sorry, uh, and then listen to all the stories and all the stories from the families are talking about how they're trying to survive or get out of the water. So the depiction of like uh, Michelle have already explained very details, the debris and everything that I said put on uh, the section part of uh, that film was uh, very powerful. I mean, I could imagine how horrendous the water had and, and the impact is it on, on the people? Because uh, when I hear the stories, I heard how my cousins have to, have to, have to lost her sister's hand in the waters, trying to, even trying to get herself out the water and, and at the same time, she has to see the disappearance of her own sister. So it is, it is such a heartbreaking uh, scene, I think. So that's why, I don't know, even though I was not there, but every time I see this section of the wave, it really relates me because everyone is told, talking about that water, that, that, that water that uh, no one haven't, have seen before. So uh, yeah, I congratulate uh, Isaac for putting such amazing effort on the movie. I think it's a very well um, craft masterpiece and, and I think the Achenese people should just watch it and be grateful of this kind of living documentation. Thank you, Rizana, for sharing uh, your story and for your kind words. And I, I, I agree, I mean, it is heartbreaking. That, that, that is the key word. Uh, to any, anybody who learns about the details of, of what happened, uh, little by little, it, it's just overwhelming and it, it is heartbreaking because there were so many instances of, of people lose, losing their loved ones in such um, unexpected ways. And that, that heartbreaking emotion is one of the emotions that we try to capture and we hopefully transmit it to the, to the viewer. The water is like spending water coming to us. Like spending water coming to us. We just lucky because the gate of the mayor house is uh, is filtering the, the the trash from the sea, what the water brings. But in front of me, everybody is dying because of the gate. Very, what you call like a knife. So everybody is get killed there because of the because they're standing on the on the gate yeah so i can see that many people died there we just hopeless at that time we just praying i just praying in my heart that god this maybe my time hopeless
I just, I cannot think, but everybody in my mind is just like a very quiet, very quiet. I just praying in my heart. The water is very black, so I cannot, I cannot think even that I cannot breathe or not. I can see that I'm very close with my husband. We climb the tree, but that's very hard. I, mean, I cannot, even I cannot climb. Then my husband trying to push me to get hike, hiking in the, in the tree. Also my mother, we, we're trying to get my mother first, and then me, and then we are surviving in the trees after the water is getting down. Thank you. As the, uh, the panelists already mentioned, uh, the movie makes extensive use of drawings and animated recreations, and of course, original footage that we managed to get from a variety of sources. Um, and one of the things that we tried to do in this scene that you just saw, which is a, a, a portion of the scene, was not to explain what happened or not to try to piece everything in a linear, logical way. We just went along with the stream of consciousness that this uh, remarkable lady was describing her experience and with her own introduction of, of, of humor in the middle of such uh, tragedy. So I would like uh, if our panelists could comment about uh, the use of animation, drawings, and those very stylized clips that we have here and there throughout uh, the movie in order to communicate the emotion of, of the moment, the emotion that the speakers, the interviewees are, are experiencing. Uh, would you like to comment, Annabelle, on this uh, point? Yes, I, th I think one of the things that the, um, that the film really brought out is, again, for those of us who were privileged and lucky enough not to ever live through a tsunami, is as you think of water, a tsunami is water. But of course, what the film brought out repeatedly over and over again, both in testimonies and through these animations, was the terrifying um, visceral physical nature of that wave that it wasn't just water it was full of razor sharp debris um, that came with a with an unimaginable force um, or, or mud as one of the um, interviewers um, said it was mud churned up it was you couldn't swim it, it wasn't like swimming in water it was swimming in mud but um, that was really um, that aspect was really brought out very, very forcefully through the animations. I felt, you know, the continuous animation showing those, um, exactly as Michelle mentioned, the, um, the splintering of the wood. And, and one can just imagine um, how any, any human at all would um, face, would, would, um, would fare faced with, with this barrage this, this of, 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 of weaponry coming at them. But of course, the most extraordinary thing, and this is also captured in the film, is that there are some who did survive. And um, and Ibu, I think Ibu Neti, um, who, you know, was hit, bit caught between two cars and somehow surfaced, and we and we heard from her in the film. So that's perhaps almost um there were some unbelievable stories that came out of that but linked with the um with you know the animations um conveying that sense of the destruct destructiveness of all the material that was that was caught up in the water and for me one of some of the most extraordinary scenes were the original tsunami footage of the debris that was coming towards a bridge but you had about four or five young men jumping agilely from 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 um from pile to pile i trying to look for whether there are any bodies or anything to but 
at the most extraordinary risk when, when one could feel at any stage, you know, any of those paths could be could turn over or be submerged or hit into the bridge. So that was really, um, you know, my heart was in my mouth watching scenes like that. And that is what what I think was greatly enhanced by the by the animations. Thank you, Annabelle. Uh, one of the things that we try to avoid in using all these uh, uh, news footage was uh, uh, extensive or shocking images of destruction and death. Uh, we tried not to show it because it wasn't really necessary to show it. Uh, I think the, the, with sounds and with the editing, we tried to convey the sense of destruction. So I, I would like to ask uh, Rizana, since we screened the, the film a few times uh, locally in Banda Aceh, did you get any comments from uh, your colleagues and your friends and family about the fact that you barely see uh, the ugly side, the very ugly side of, of destruction? It's, it's kind of hinted. Did, did anybody comment about that aspect of things? Well, they actually didn't literally comment on that because for those who experience uh, directly uh, the the tragedy, they they just could see it. I mean, it's 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 within them. So sometimes, like uh, yeah, you know, my family said that uh, all the bodies are in different shapes and conditions like that, and it's visualized also for us uh, who was not in Banda Aceh. Like for me, like I said, I, I watched through the TV channel. And so it's just so surreal. I mean, that's why, you know, the sense and the feelings, the overwhelming feelings of that fear of helpless, not knowing what your loved one's uh, 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 condition in Banda Aceh, I think it's much more, um, I mean, increasing or, uh, I mean, it's more, it's more if you are not in Banda Aceh because, it's, you don't take it for granted to see all the bodies inside. But uh, like uh, I agree with Annabelle, you know, like you mentioned, you don't have to show all the footage and it is scary, but uh, how you replace it to these animations, right? Uh, I think for me, it's, it's really lively because when that's when I, I'm sorry, uh, the back sound here in Aceh, we are <laughs> it's, uh, doing a uh, azan. So, uh, what, I, what I'm trying to tell you that uh, I'm, I'm considering myself an audio person and I like to listen to people telling stories, right? So, and every time they tell the stories, I could visual, visualize what they experience. And you managed to capture that, like in the moment of Ibuneti, uh, it's only an animation of a woman trying to struggle to get up the water, uh, but, and then she narrates it. And that's what I hear from the others who survive. Uh, they said even a good swimmer could not swim in that condition because all, all the the debris and everything is just, I mean, uh, it's it's beyond your control. And even I have a I have a nephew, uh, he was seven years old at that time, and he was uh, separated from his parents, and uh, and then he was found uh, alive, survived on a rooftop of uh, a house. And then what he could only remember that there was a there was a big cow, so it doesn't make sense. But you know, every voice or every uh, people experience the different ways in and how they deal with um, you know, when they were trapped in those kind of water. And I mean, just putting those image like uh, the real one footage and then the animation. I don't know. I personally see that as a strength for that because. You try to recall on what the other people say and try to see that on the animation that you made. Thank you, Rizana. Um, next, um, I would like to play the third clip, which is a five minute sequence where uh, people from Banda Aceh uh, talk about their, how the conflict impacted their lives very briefly. And then we have uh, one of the GAM commanders, regional commanders, talk about how, in his opinion, the tsunami contributed to the end of the conflict.
payah minta apa eh. Ngab buat kau yang dajak kadang-kadang kat tepi dan balu maruh tamai tapi-tapi. Memang agak payah. Kondenya yo karena tu bedi tapi-tapi. Ha. Karena sweeping lah, mau yang dajak kok ji kadang-kadang ugli-ugli hanya dajak ali. Orang dajak ugli itu kena TNI, han TNI kena awak gam ini kan. Yo dibandingkan awal eh, mungkin karena awal mungkin lebih sulit karena komplik ah. Yo ini mungkin lebih mudah. Karena hanya ali komplik. Jadi ndak ada kerja ho-ho mentung dan yo mangat. Hanya halangan-halangan ni tapu. Tapi uh, sampai di Langsa sore itu, pada hari Minggu itu, uh, kami tidak berani jalan lagi karena sudah waktu itu sedang konflik dan terjadi sering terjadi perampasan dan sebagainya di daerah Perlak. Jadi oleh karena itu kita tidak berani malam jalan dan uh, nginap di Langsa. Ketika itu langsung putus total ya. Hubungan komunikasi via telepon, via HP itu putus total. Jaringan semua rusak. Jadi kita melakukan uh, hubungan dengan HT. Halo Tenggo, HT itu radio punya Pak. Militer punya radio. Ketika itu saya uh, juga tidak tahu uh, tentang luasnya tsunami itu di mana sampai di mana. Ketika hari ketiga saya baru tahu kalau tsunami itu ternyata ada di Melabu, ada di Bandar Aceh, ada di kawasan lain, ya termasuk di Malaysia dan juga di Thailand sebagian ya. Jadi ketika itu kami menganggap yang bahwa lokasi kejadian itu di kawasan kami saja, ternyata luas. Setelah tsunami. Mungkin kami agak tinggi, bisa terselamatkan. Kemudian mereka di bawah, rata-rata mereka di bawah pantai, dekat pantai. Itu semua mereka di bawah air. Bahkan banyak sekali mereka yang meninggal dunia akibat tsunami. Ketika kami melakukan penyisiran, seperti di, di kecamatan Pekan Bada dan juga di kecamatan uh, Loknga, selain daripada mayat-mayat itu dari masyarakat sipil itu kebanyakan daripada militer. Kalau di sebelah sini banyak tentara, sebelah kecamatan ini, kalau kecamatan Pekan Badai itu banyak brimob. Jadi rata-rata itu mayat mereka yang kita dapatkan. Kemudian senjata mereka antara senjata dan mayat itu sering tidak jauh. Itulah lebih kurang. Karena ketika itu pemimpin GAM meminta supaya uh, adanya gencatan senjata uh, untuk memberikan peluang kepada internasional untuk memberikan bantuan kepada masyarakat Aceh yang mengalami musibah tsunami. Ketika itu pemimpin GAM di luar negeri menyatakan uh, gencatan senjata sepihak. Jadi kami menerima di lapangan karena kenapa? Karena keluarga kami korban daripada tsunami. Sebab ada perdamaian di Aceh ini semata-mata memang karena tsunami. Gempa dan tsunami. Itu yang penyebab awal. Sehingga terjadilah perdamaian di Aceh. So, uh, 
I would like Michelle, um, I would like to ask Michelle if you could please uh, comment on, on the statement that uh, the commander just made there uh, in terms of the tsunami, the earthquake and the tsunami really being responsible for the, the, the end of the civil war. Uh, I have talked to a lot of people, as I'm sure you all have, and the opinions are, are split. Some people think, some people have said that uh, that was just a coincidence. Others uh, don't agree with that. So what is your opinion since you have studied the conflict, the origins and the evolution of the conflict in, in, in such detail? I think it's true, undisputable that both sides changed tactics after the tsunami and, and that they shared loss definitely of their friends, their family members there. It, it definitely bolstered people's resolve to prevent further loss in the aftermath of the disaster. And so there was this deeply emotional response to the scale of the tragedy on both sides, uh, because there was an advisor of um, uh, the President Yudhoyono at the time, and he said the only time that he saw President Yudhoyono uh, in a state of anguish was after his visit to Aceh after the tsunami. Um, and yet it's easy to infer from Tankul Muharram, the, the GAM commander who's uh, interviewed, uh, his, his statement that the tsunami itself ended uh, the conflict, which is, of course, not the case, um, because we've seen how other separatist conflicts in southern Thailand and in Sri Lanka uh, continued, and they were, they were affected very badly by the tsunami as well, and they failed to reach negotiated settlements. And in the context of the film, the film in the epilogue itself states that the conflict didn't end until eight months after the tsunami um, uh, through, a, through the signing of the Helsinki peace agreement. Um, so there, there was a change in attitudes that allowed people to come together for the Helsinki talks, which extended between January and August, but the, the tsunami itself didn't, um, didn't end the conflict. And in and a couple of weeks after the tsunami, uh, there was uh, the, the military's um, surveillance of foreign aid workers is a, it testifies to that. So they started heavily policing the movements of foreign workers in out of urban centres uh, that were hard hit by the tsunami. And um, Halim, the worker in, who was interviewed in the film, alluded to this when he said, civilians couldn't go to the mountains because uh, soldiers on both sides were fighting there. And that's something that certainly continued after the tsunami. And uh, Tenkul Maharam also took, he said, when we went down and we saw the bodies of uh, Bree mob officers, and first we saw their bodies and then we saw their weapons and they took their weapons. And in fact, when I went to Aceh after the tsunami, the motorbike that, was, that I rode was uh, a former Indonesian security forces bike that was taken from the rubble. But the fighting did continue inland and, uh, and that was well removed from where the foreign aid workers were. And at the same time, there were 550,000 Achenese, 550, civilians who were displaced by the tsunami. And they often went back to natal homes in inland rural areas where the fighting was ongoing. And the international, a lot of the international aid organizations that were in Aceh at the time weren't even aware there was a conflict because they were so their, their budgets and their energies were focused uh, on urban centers. So I think that it was, so my view is that it was, it was political will rather than the tsunami that contributed to the cessation of hostilities. And the shock of the tsunami created a circuit breaker that both GAM and uh, the Indonesian government were able to use to their advantage to reassess their respective positions. And either of them could have elected to miss this opportunity, but they didn't. And the timing was great because they had a president who was open to resolving the, the, the Aceh conflict through a peace process, unlike the previous president, Megawati Sukarnoputri, who preferred a military solution. Um, the conditions were ripe. There was a vice president, Yusuf Kala, who had long been involved in peace talks with involving the free out chair movement. So either side could have chosen to unilaterally withdraw from those talks. And they almost did on several occasions in Helsinki. But the fact that they, the tsunami added to their political will to stay the course and 
eventually arrive at a, a settlement in the form of the law on governing Aceh that was able to provide a firm foundation for peace. All right, so um, I would like to play uh, the next clip in just a second, but I would like to, to explain uh, the, the purpose of this moment in the film. Uh, about half the first half of the film, if you will, uh, provides details about the before the wave and during the wave and, and, and the conflict, of course. This scene basically introduces this, the second part of the film, which is after the wave, after the water started to, to move away and people started to, to try to figure out what they had to do and, 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 and process the event. Um, well, I'll let you watch the film, but th this is the film that announces the second half of the, of the film. Tidak cukup tenaga di sini. Tidak cukup tenaga saya untuk bisa melaksanakan secepat mungkin, gitu lah. If you haven't watched the film, it, it's hard to understand what's going on here. But one of the things that in this sequence, I mean, but one of the things that we tried to convey was the sense of despair, chaos, and, and pause, and then facing reality and, and using the spirituality of, of, of the faith, the religious faith to try and heal and and continue living. It, it's, it's a lot of very complex feelings, very sometimes opposing forces uh, in the middle of heartbreak. And I would like to ask our panelists if, if each one of them could please comment on, on the, 
the, their opinion about the, the role of faith in helping people heal. Um, it's, um, it's a very, very profound question, Isaac. And of course, I think faith has placed a very important part for almost everyone in the film. And, you know, we talked earlier about Ibunetti's almost miraculous, miraculous escape from the water. And she felt it was because God was looking after her. Um, but, you know, one thing about um, this, the role of, of faith, faith and the future, I mean, I, um, it, we, we have heard quite a lot that compared to the fatalities in Aceh, that on the neighbouring island of Simului, which was closer to the epicentre of the earthquake, um, that the, um, that the, um, the number of deaths was much lower than expected because there was an embedded historical memory of tsunamis, which meant that everyone, um, as soon as the earthquake had happened, people ran to the hills. And this didn't happen in Aceh, where we heard time and time again, people saying there is no, you know, there's never been tsunamis in Aceh. And I was sort of pondering this and thinking, you know, what is, um, you know, going, how would, would faith and other things play a um, a role in um, in future prevention, and I in terms of Aceh's history, the one real continuity throughout has been religious education, which is like part of everyday life for centuries. It's embedded in children, and I think this it's actually through the faith and through the role of um, you know. And Michelle mentioned that the one um, interestingly enough, you know, one voice we didn't hear was from ulamas, but actually um, would be the embedding of lessons from the tsunami in the as part of religious education in the daya in the um, religious um, ed ed establishments, because you have school curriculums that come and go. You have, you know, you have the tsunami museum. We have doc we have films. We, you know, but none of us know how long these things will stay um, it for the future. But um, religious education in Aceh is the one thing which has for centuries you've had a, um, a, a you know, a continuous stream. So I think that that role um, has a real of, relig of religious religion, relig religious education. It's not quite, I'm not quite answering your question, Isaac, I'm going to another aspect of it, but has such an important role to play in, in learning lessons from the past for the future. Thank you. Yes, I agree. And as a uh, Achenese and as a Muslim, uh, we do, we, I mean, I believe that the role of the religion has uh, contributed in how people uh, of Achenese uh, overcome or cope with this kind of tragedy. Because uh, we, yeah, in, the, in our teaching of this uh, religion, we also taught that if you died within the disasters, your, um, uh, yeah, or you are, I mean, uh, drawn in a water, you will be called, yeah, you'll be uh, survive later on the, uh, in the hereafter and then you go to heaven. So that's a promise in our religion. And some of the people uh, rely on that, that kind of uh, teachings and principles. That's why uh, then they become uh, such a belief of the fatalistic that uh, this disaster is predetermined by God. So some, some of uh, people think that this condition, uh, they have to just accept it. Uh, at the same time, they have to move on. So it's it's quite a very tricky kind of uh, dealing with this kind of situation. But actually, uh, this uh, perception is also quite dangerous because then people, if they continue to hold on this fatalistic belief, uh, then they will ignore and just uh, undermine all the condition or the prevention for a future fatalistic. So yeah, that's what is happening actually at the moment when we are facing this pandemic, this COVID also. There's a pro cons about how religion, how, uh, I mean, Muslims have to really face and um, counter this, uh, this pandemic. So it's quite, yeah, quite the same, but you know, what I'm trying to say that uh, sometimes religion uh, is, uh, yeah, could be the source and manifest for people to move on, but at the same time, yeah, they just uh, an excuse for them just to accept because it's predetermined. Yeah, um, 
I mean, I, I agree with both Annabelle and Rizana that there's there's no doubt that Islam is extremely important to people making un, uh, making sense of and healing from a tragedy. Uh, but I also agree with Rizana's point that it can be a little dangerous in some ways uh, when uh, Islam becomes used in, and, in, and I'm going to take it in a different direction from how Rizana used it, but in the direction of Nora the housewife uh, who lost her children and went to um, Medan and she appears in the epilogue and she reflects a view that is that was politically manipulated after the tsunami to advance a particular agenda that turned religion into morality as an end in itself rather than morality for social welfare and justice and and Nora, for those of you who haven't seen the film Nora the housewife uh says that this it takes the view that the tsunami occurred because of the sins of the people. And unless people re, uh, uh, stop sinning, then a bigger disaster will come that will wreak even greater havoc. And I think that every in every crisis, there's opportunity, including uh, for particular illiberal um, interpretations of uh, Sharia to take hold. And I think that one of the, it, it, while, while uh, Islamic law has definitely had some benefits, uh, there's been this kind of moral vigilantism attached to the certain aspects of the implementation, like in the form of the Sharia police, for example, who earned a reputation for thuggery against civilians because of their emphasis on cracking down on morality uh, for um, indecent encounters and uh, and gambling. And the people who bear the brunt of these kind of um, Islamic legal uh, can't, uh, re by, re by laws are the poor, poor people and women uh, because uh, they can't afford to pay the fines and they're not shielded from um, the humiliation of uh, public whippings, which is, is another thing that's taken uh, root in 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 the development of uh, post tsunami Sharia that wasn't there before, so I, I think definitely I mean religion to to heal from disasters, but the political dimension I think can be dangerous when it's politically manipulated. Thank you, Michelle, for your comments. So so yes, uh, it, um, it it is a tricky issue, and uh, that is one of the issues that we try to resolve. Uh, in the last 20 minutes of the film, the, the balance between how you go about all, all these issues that were mentioned by our three uh, panelists. Uh, the last five minutes of the film, which is the last clip, one of the, or it, it contains a statement by one of the interviewees about uh, the fact that um, we knew that the tsunami, uh, that, that an earthquake is a precursor to the tsunami uh, we could have saved ourselves. And with those words, uh, we tried to wrap up the communal feeling about, about this catastrophe. A Chinese actually, their character is very wrong in dealing especially with uh, death. A Chinese is very convinced that their death has been decided by God. The character of a Chinese is Historically, you know, mostly warrior. Always with war. So they are easier to accept that. Especially for fishermen, like in my place, for example, they always have someone who passed away in the, in the sea because of the way so to cope with that, I think it's easier for them.
ثاني هو الاشياء من القران بيسي كل نفس زي قط الموت every soul will uh, one day will meet the death any soul إذا جاء أجلهم لا يستأخرون ساعة ما لا يستغفرون. When the, your time has come, no one can what you call uh, delay. You, know? you cannot delay it. You can't make it faster. Any burial ceremony always followed by that kind of statement. Like every one of us, you know, when they die. You don't know the place, you don't know the time. punya informasi tentang tsunami saya pikir kita selamat semua walaupun ini sudah kehendak Allah karena tidak tsunami itu tidak datang serta-merta dimulai dengan adanya gempa yang demikian besar kita bisa terbebas dari tsunami karena tenggang waktu antara gempa pertama dengan tsunami itu uh, cukup jarak cukup memberikan kesempatan kepada kita untuk menyelamatkan diri Uh, well, I want to thank all of you for um, participating in this roundtable. I want to thank our three panelists. Uh, thank you, Rizana. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you, Annabelle. Uh, thank you, Naoko. Uh, thank you, the support staff who helped us uh, run this Zoom meeting so smoothly. All right. So have a great day. And uh, thank you so much. Mm -hmm.